there. My name is Ken Mayer, and I'm going to be your instructor for this course on CWNA, the Certified Wireless Network Associate. Over the last 30 years, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of different technologies. I won't focus on many of the equipment that I uh, work with through the uh, routing, switching, and the infrastructure, but rather the uh, work that I have done so far with uh, companies like Cisco, with uh, NetScreen, which is now part of Juniper, and Aruba Networks, which is about the wireless communications. I've been involved with uh, those technologies at least the last 15 of the 30 years that I've been in this business, and I hope to be able to take some of that information be able to give it to you, uh, things I've seen with the uh, deployments for large companies, for small companies, and uh, all those things in between. Now in this module, we're going to talk about some of the history of wireless communications. We'll look at some of the different standards, some of the regulatory agencies like the FCC, the ITUR, uh, IETF, the ISOC hierarchy, the Wi-Fi Alliance, the IEEE, the ISO, and however many other uh, acronyms you think I can uh, put out there for you. Uh, we'll also talk a bit about the hierarchical model of our networks and uh, where the wireless access points uh, fit into there. We'll look at some of the differences about carrier signals and uh, again some of the fundamentals of communications. So wireless communications, believe it or not, have been worked with since the 19th century. I know that seems like a long time ago, because it was, uh, but we had a lot of scientists that were out there, people like Tesla and some others, who were experimenting with uh, wireless communications. And they were successful at doing some of those types of communications, but it really wasn't, well, as it evolved, it wasn't until about the 70s that the state of Hawaii actually had wireless communications uh, that they were using to be able to transmit information between the islands. Now, the medium that they used, they called it Aloha. It makes sense. It was Hawaii. And it operated at 400 megahertz, which is certainly not the frequency range we're using today. In the 1990s, this is again moving forward in our uh, history, uh, we saw commercial wireless starting to uh, take place, operating at the 900 megahertz range. Basically, things like cordless telephones. If you even remember the day when we actually had telephones that were attached somewhere to uh, a uh, jack in the wall of our house, but uh, that and some other uh, kids' toys, wireless toys, um, began in the 90s, and that was the uh, common range that was being used. Now, the International Telecommunications Union Radio Communications Sector, big name for them, the ITUR, and uh, other local entities like the Federal Communications Commission uh, started setting the rules for what a user can or can't do with a radio transmitter. Now, these organizations uh, manage and regulate the frequencies that we can use, whether licensed or unlicensed, the power levels of the uh, transmissions, and the types of transmissions or the methods that we use for sending information. They're also working together to help us guide the growth and the expansion of uh, what's being uh, used with today's uh, wireless users. So it's um, really kind of a, a big area. There's a lot of companies, a lot of government agencies, and not just in the United States, but also in most of the countries around the world. And you'll see that there are some differences. If you were to travel, you might see uh, a different number of channels being used at different frequencies. Um, you know, maybe a uh, different uh, power level is allowed. So it's important as for vendors to be able to work with these different agencies to figure out uh, how to build and create their products for the uh, countries in which they're selling this information or the uh, actual equipment, not the information. Now, the IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, is the one that's creating the standards for compatibility and coexistence between networking equipment. Now, this group of uh, people is, uh, you know, several hundred people in this organization, and the idea is, is that they're not building the actual equipment, but they're creating the guidelines of how these uh, different pieces of equipment from different vendors should work so that if you, say, uh, have uh, an access point from uh, one uh, location or one company and uh, you bought uh, a laptop that has a, a wireless card built by another organization, how do we know that they're supposed to work together? And, and so that's what the IEEE standards are designed to do is to be able to make that type of uh, compatibility work but it still has to fall inside the uh, guidelines set by the FCC. The Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, are the ones that create Internet standards. Again, they create standards, they're not creating the actual product. These uh, standards are designed to be integrated into the wireless networking and security protocols and standards that we use for Wi-Fi communications. Another group, the Wi-Fi Alliance, is the one that's going to perform certification testing to make sure that the actual equipment by the vendors 
um, whatever wireless networking equipment they use, is conforming to the IEEE standards of 802.11 when it comes to the different types of communication guidelines for wireless local area networks. Now, the International Standards Organization designed what they call the OSI model, the Open System Interconnect. And it was, again, guidelines of a way to help us uh, know how technologies can talk to each other. So when we're taking a look at the OSI model, we have to remember that we still are going to, ha more than likely, uh, when we're creating these wireless networks, have to be involved with the uh, IP protocol for the network layer and the different types of transport protocols because we are facilitating these uh, packets to be able to go from one uh, host to another host over a combination of wireless and wired networks. So as the administrator, you need to have some familiarity with uh, these uh, layers three and four, where when you think about what we're doing, and you know this is my picture of an access point, when we think about the uh, actual wireless uh, radio frequency, you know that's pointing us here at the physical layer. That's uh, instead of a uh, copper wire or a fiber cable, uh, we are sending radio frequencies to represent the uh, medium that we're uh, transmitting at. And also we have to have a way of doing communications that we'll talk more about at layer two with the data link layer. Now what's important about the OSI model is that uh, the whole goal was to uh, be able to say, hey look, we have to be able to have what they call these PDUs, the ability for one layer to talk to the layer above it and the layer below it. Meaning that it doesn't matter what we use in the physical realm as long as whatever technology is capable of working at the data link layer and whatever is at the data link layer can work at the network layer. In fact, it was designed, again, as a model that we could just rip any one of these layers out and replace it with a new layer. As an example, in the network layer, we've been focusing on IP version 4 for a very long time. And then suddenly we ripped that out and now put in IP version 6. No problem at all with IP version 6 as long as it can talk to the transport layer and talk to the data link layer. And that was the uh, beauty of having this type of an open model. Rather than having uh, companies uh, create their own protocols that are uh, basically proprietary to them, this was designed for open standards uh, for any vendor creating this type of equipment. Now the FCC was established by the Communications Act of 1934. Now, think about what's really happening back in 1934. We did a lot with radio, obviously, a lot of radio shows, families watching or listening to uh, the radio in the uh, night times. So the FCC uh, obviously has grown since then with what they are responsible for, and they are responsible for regulating any interstate and international communications that are done by radio or by television, uh, over a wire, by satellite, by cable, I mean, any type of electronic communication. They also regulate the licensed spectrum and the unlicensed spectrum. Now, when I say licensed spectrum, if you think about uh, your AM and FM radio channels, I mean, obviously, those are licensed to companies that are broadcasting on those uh, stations. And part of the reason for the licensing is to make sure that we don't have different uh, uh, radio stations trying to compete on the same band and uh, cause interference. So there's a big reason why there needs to be a license for that. The uh, unlicensed spectrums, are those that you don't have to use a license for, but the downside is, is that uh, since nobody has to get a license to use that medium, that we can have a lot of different products that can interfere. As an example, if uh, you're in your office, you have Wi-Fi, what you're gonna notice is that uh, as you get close to, let's say, the kitchen or, or the uh, cafeteria, that things like the microwave are gonna cause interference because they're using some of those same frequencies, and, um, and that becomes a bit of a problem. So we do have the um, issue, and we'll talk more about it when we get into these communications, of having other devices or other types of technology basically stepping on your data signal uh, within your location. And so uh, that's probably the uh, downside when it comes to using an unlicensed medium. Now when we talk about any of the communications, any of the frequencies, licensed or unlicensed, the FCC still has regulations that uh, we have to abide by. Now, I know I just said unlicensed, anybody can use it, but we still have to deal with the FCC rules, such as the frequency that we're using, uh, the bandwidth information, something we're going to talk a lot about and force you to do a little bit of math, which is the maximum power of the intentional radiator 
well, basically the antenna or the equipment, but we'll get into those. Um, and the maximum, what they call EIRP, or the equivalent isotropically radiated power. So yes, believe it or not, with your, uh, let's say your access points, there is only so much power that we're allowed to use total for the uh, communications. And, um, you know, technically, we could communicate, if we had enough power, over many, many miles, uh, you know, hundreds of miles or more, just like you see with uh, things, again, like radio stations. So, uh, but we don't do that in our office environment, um, again, because of other uh, regulations from the FCC, and we'll get, talk some more still about uh, the power calculation. And, of course, they also regulate the use, uh, whether equipment is ready for indoor use or outdoor use. And uh, also, as I just talked about with these radio stations as an example, the spectrum sharing rules. So all of that is licensed um, or uh, regulated by the FCC. Now, the ITUR, uh, basically, as I said before, the International Telecommunications Union Radio Communications Sector, big name for a company or for an organization. Uh, anyway, the United Nations has tasked that organization, the ITUR, with global spectrum management. Now, in saying that, the uh, types of uh, areas, as I said before, are very important to us because each region of the world will have some of their own regulations, and so this group's trying to work with those. As an example, they have Region A, which is the Americas, uh, and we would look at uh, something like the uh, Inter-American Telecommunications Commission, which they call the CITL, um, as uh, the organization that works with and remember, there's more in the Americas than just the United States. I mean, just in North America, you have Canada, you have Mexico, and you know, other countries as you go further south. Uh, Western Europe, uh, they have uh, Region B anyway, and they use the uh, Western Europe European Confident or Conference of uh, Postal and Telecommunications Administrations. They call it CEPT. Um, and uh, again, different countries. Region C is Eastern Europe, and I won't go through and tell you all of the different names. Uh, you can certainly look at that as you go through this course. Uh, Region D, the uh, African uh, area, which uh, is interesting because I did some work recently. About six months I lived down in uh, Kenya, uh, and so I got to see a little bit more about how the regulations and laws are a little bit different um, there than they are in other regions of the world. And then, of course, the uh, Asia-Pacific, uh, which would include Asia and Australia, uh, telecommunications, uh, what they call the APT. So we have an... Uh, the United Nations has an organization they're working with that is breaking down the different regions of the world and trying to work with how wireless communications should be used in those different parts of the world. The Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, is one of five main groups that are a part of what we call the ISOC, or the Internet Society. And uh, you'll see a little breakdown chart here in just a bit to uh, better explain the hierarchy of uh, where IETF fits into the uh, Internet Society. But what they're doing is um, basically the IETF is the one that does a lot of the designs, creates a lot of what we call the request for comments that eventually become standards that we use in different types of Internet communication. So uh, in the ISOC, by the way, besides IETF, they have the Internet Architecture Board, uh, they also have uh, the uh, you know, group that assigns uh, names and uh, IP addresses. They call it ICANN, or the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Uh, and even in that organization, it's broken down by different regions of the world. They have the uh, Internet Engineering Steering Group and the Internet Research Task Force. Now, for those of you seeking certifications, you don't really need to know about all of the different pieces of ISOC. But when you're out there and you're working in the production world, uh, it is important that you understand what some of these regulations are and how they're changing because we have to work with them. So the goal here is to let you know about these different organizations that uh, you will hopefully in your life of uh, working with wireless continue to stay up to date with things as they change. Now, one of the RFCs that I was just talking about, the uh, request for comments, these you know, start off as ideas that get published and then other groups can add their thoughts to these uh, RFCs. And if everybody likes this new thought, then you know, it basically gets an update. But as it gets updated, it gets a different number. Uh, and so you can trace back many of the RFCs to um, you know, almost generationally through uh, the ways in which they have evolved. But anyway, RFC 3935 is designed to give us the purpose of what IETF is supposed to do. 
And what they're supposed to do in their part of ISOC is to give us high quality, relevant technical and engineering documents that influence the way people design, use and manage the internet and in such a way to make the internet work better. Now the documents will include protocol standards, uh, they'll talk about the best current practices and uh, including some uh, informational documents of different kinds uh, basically around how we do communications. Now, I know I said about the internet, but a lot of what the IETF does and designs are going to be standards that we use inside of our networks. I mean, just as an example, the way in which we use uh, IP addresses, and uh, we're going to use those inside of our network as well as getting out into the internet. And so that's where we see a lot of the work that the IETF has done for us. So again, at the top level, we have the Internet Society, ISOC. And uh, from there, you'll see that we branch down to the uh, names and numbers with ICANN. And that's pretty much where we stop there. They're the ones that would, uh, again, approve uh, new domain names if uh, you wanted to use those or the uh, types of uh, address, um, IP addresses you use. And then on the design of, right, the, the new uh, updates and what we can do better with uh, our communications, we'll start through the Internet Architecture Board. And uh, from there, they're going to have a research task force working underneath them, as well as the Internet uh, Engineering Steering Group. I get, really, again, like I said, you don't have to memorize all of this for uh, those of you seeking certifications uh, in this uh, particular course. But it's just information, I think, that is crucial for you to understand so that you know where all this stuff comes from. Anyway, the uh, Internet Engineering Steering Group is the ones that are basically in this hierarchy over the uh, IETF. And so what the, does the IETF do? I said, well, in essence, they're trying to make the Internet better. So, you know, that might be with applications, general protocols, operations management, uh, different types of routing protocols. I mean, IETF uh, well, were the ones that uh, helped us with uh, designing the OSPF routing protocol. Transport layer information, uh, again, uh, Internet standards, best practices, security information, real-time applications such as uh, voice over IP, and the type of infrastructure to support that. And as they put all of these different ideas together that, have, as I said, eventually become um, uh, our standards, you're going to see them published as these requests for comments. The Wi-Fi Alliance is a nonprofit organization of about 550 different vendors that is devoted to improving the equipment that we use with wireless communications. The goal of the Wi-Fi Alliance is to examine the different vendors' equipments and make sure that they work together, work at the way the standard was set, and that it would interoperate with any other vendor. Um, and so when they test that equipment, you'll often see the little Wi-Fi certified logo, which basically tells you that it's going to work with uh, the majority of other networking vendors. I mean, that's your Cisco's, your Juniper's, your Aruba's, um, you, you know, it just goes on and on and on with all of the uh, different uh, types of uh, people or companies that are building equipment to know that they interoperate. Now, the IEEE, as I've talked about before, is the one that comes up with uh, some of the standards. Remember, they're not building equipment. They're just coming up with the uh, guidelines and the standards that we should build our equipment to. They have about 400,000 members in 160 different countries. And as they uh, create these, they're just, you know, how, mo how else can I say it? It's just written documents. It, they're not making equipment, but they're describing how the technical processes and equipment should function. So we hope that the vendors are following those ideas, such as uh, years ago when we got excited about high throughput, 802.11n, um, the IEEE, really hadn't finished that document before vendors started putting that equipment out. And there was a problem in the early days that not everything was compatible uh, as they worked together because we didn't really have a set standard. Once it was standardized, then of course vendors made their equipment work um, with that standard and the Wi-Fi Alliance would be able to verify that they worked with, uh, within those guidelines and worked with other people's equipment. So often um, the company Cisco is uh, talked about with uh, this hierarchical model. Um, and, you know, it's, whether it was Cisco that came up with this idea uh, or it was some other guidelines, they're the ones that really promote it. But what the idea here is, is to talk about the structure and the building of your networks. And uh, the uh, three areas they have are the access layer, the distribution layer, and the core layer. 
So let's talk a little bit about what happens uh, with wireless communications. Because if you think about it, uh, they are in what we would call the access layer. So these are little laptops. Because that's where we access the network. A anything that is an endpoint, uh, an endpoint of communications, just simply means that the device is either sending a new communication or it's receiving some communications, but nothing is passing through it like a router or a switch would be. Um, so that's the access layer where we access it. And if I have these uh, computers that are doing Wi-Fi, then they need a device such as the access point to be able to associate with, and that means that they're entering the access layer. They're accessing your network because obviously at some point you're going to enter into the wired network. And so that's uh, one part, a big critical part, really, of the design. But then we have to worry about how do we get from, let's say, one area of our network to, let's say, another area of our network that's also an access layer. Maybe they're not even wireless. Maybe it's uh, a server farm or, uh, you know, virtual machines or whatever uh, else that uh, you might have. That, in, that access, especially in larger networks, has to go through a distribution layer. The distribution layer, typically we would think of routers, so these circles with an X as a, as a router, or we can even have a switch that does uh, routing based on IP addresses. But the distribution layer is our method of being able to get from one point to the other to be uh, distributed our traffic throughout the network. It's also one of the, uh, classically, the first place that we would introduce security. But we've done a lot more now to have uh, security types of uh, technology or security um, uh, methods available even at the access layer. Security is an important part, uh, obviously, these days with the number of uh, hacks that we hear about on the news. So it's policy-based connectivity. And then the core was all about high-speed switching. The goal of the core was to not worry about security. We wanted to move things at highest speeds possible. We often see today that from the core, we would uh, connect to, uh, let's say, like a private cloud uh, inside of your network. And, uh, and that could be, um, again, a virtualized server farm or something else. We see the core as our way to get out to the Internet. The idea being that uh, on these edge, or what we call the edge, that um, we have other security apparatuses that are protecting the core uh, from the traffic that gets there. But once we get to the core, then we want to have, uh, like I said, the highest speed possible with nothing uh, stopping us. So um, a lot of what we call edge services, which are not depicted here um, in this little picture, connect to the core in uh, most of the typical types of designs. When we talk about carrier signals, we're talking about ways in which we can transmit our data. Now, when it comes down to it, all we're sending is a bunch of ones and zeros, part of what we call binary communications. And those ones and zeros, when put together and read by an application or you know, whatever it is that we're uh, using for the communications, will understand what the message is. Now, those ones and zeros could be sent by uh, light through fiber optics. It could be sent by uh, electrical current through a copper wire. It's just a method of being able, we have to have a method or some sort of media to carry the ones and zeros. In this case, we're going to use radio frequency. And, um, and so that means that our transmitters need to have a way of being able to send the ones and the zeros from one location to another. Again, the idea is that the receiver would understand the pattern of information and would be able to decipher the ones and zeros being sent so that we can put that data together. Now, if a signal fluctuates or if it's altered, even slightly, then the signal hopefully can still be interpreted so that the data can still be properly sent and received. And, um, and so this is called the carrier signal. And in fact, what you're going to see is that uh, sometimes we purposely see fluctuations in that signal to help uh, identify the ones and the zeros. Come on.